Hello everyone, greetings from the Nile. We're in Luxor to explore a hallmark of ancient Egyptian sacral architecture. Let's find out more about art, history and rituals performed in the more than 3000 years old Luxor Temple. I'm finally here, the brand new Sphinx Avenue. See you on another side. Yes, you heard me right. I said brand new, as after over seven decades of restoration works on November 25th, 2021, a grand and pompous opening celebration was held and the avenue was finally opened for tourists. During the Middle Kingdom, a small temple of Amun stood here. In the 14th century BCE, one of the greatest pharaohs of the New Kingdom, Amenhotep III, began to rebuild and renovate the existing shrine. His successors, Tutankhamun, Horemheb, and obviously the greatest pharaonic builder, Ramesses II, modified and enlarged the temple. During Amenhotep's lifetime, it was 190 meters long, but less than two centuries later, in the time of Ramesses II, its length reached 260 meters. The entryway to the temple, pylon, statues and obelisks were erected by Ramesses the Great. made of pink granite, monumental more than 20 meters high obelisks were overlooking the main city for centuries. It's, at least for me, still mind-blowing that weighing more than 200 tons each, they were transported in one piece, 160 kilometers from the Aswan quarry. Today, there's only one monolith. The western obelisk was moved to the Place de la Concorde in Paris, France in the 19th century. Its relocation took six years and cost the equivalent of 16 million euro or 19 million dollars. The obelisks are the only ones existing with two rounded out opposing sides. The reason behind it still hasn't been discovered. Moreover, the French obelisk is slightly smaller than the Egyptian one. In order to achieve so important for ancient Egyptians order and harmony, it was placed on the higher base and a little bit further from the pylon. Originally, in front of the pylon stood six statues of Ramesses the Great, two flanking the entrance were seated and the rest standing. As we've already seen in Abu Simbel, you can find the link below in the description Ramesses undoubtedly admired grandeur and did things in a big way, so it's no wonder that the statues are more than 12 meters high and each was made out of one piece of granite, weighing, depending on the source, 50 to 80 tons. The carvings on the throne are similar to those in Abu Simbel, happy god of the annual Nile flooding, tying stems of the lotus and papyrus plants, symbols of Upper and Lower Egypt. Imposing pylon, towering over a city, consists of two towers measuring 24 meters in height and 65 meters in length. Its walls display Pharaoh's military triumphs, focusing mainly on the Battle of Kadesh.
During the New Kingdom 16th to 11th centuries BCE, Thebes became the most important place in the entire Egyptian empire and by around 1500 BCE was probably the largest city in the late Bronze Age world. The cult of the supreme god, king of all gods, Amun-Ra, residing in Thebes, was never as strong as during these few centuries. The Temple of Luxor, connected to the temples of Karnak by the Sphinx Avenue, constituted together, let's call it, backbone of the city, hence quite an extraordinary axial alignment of the Luxor Temple. Instead of being oriented east-west, like a great majority of ancient Egyptian temples, it's aligned on the north-south axis to the precinct of Amun-Ra. Passing through the gateway, we enter the courtyard of Ramesses II. It measures 57 by 51 meters and features 74 columns with lotus bed capitals arranged in two rows. Initially, the courtyard was enclosed, rectangular in shape, featuring three entryways. Today, its northeastern corner is occupied by a 13th century mosque. southern part of the courtyard displays enormous statues of the pharaoh, five on the right and six on the left side. Probably five of them initially belonged to Amenhotep III, but almost two centuries later Ramesses II restored them and placed in his courtyard. Let's get a closer look at some of them. The first statue, like all in the southeast corner, is made of red granite. It's around 6 meters high and was originally holding two staffs, known as meccas, used initially as a weapon but later on as a religious attribute. Next figures, both around 5 meters high, are not only the best preserved ones, but show typical facial features of Ramesses II. Two next statues are about 6 meters high and were white crown of Upper Egypt, but unfortunately their faces have been heavily damaged. Legs of the first figure are quite detailed, knees, tibia and fibula are clearly visible, whereas the feet appeared to be swollen and definitely lacking perfection of the statue's upper part. The pedestal as well as the back pillars are inscribed with Ramesses names and titles. Here is an example of a Pshent, crown of Upper and Lower Egypt. The entrance to the colonnade is guarded by two additional figures, so altogether the temple features 19 monumental statues of Ramesses the Great. Go big or go home, am I right, your majesty? The pair of statues is made of a black granite and it is about 12 to 13 meters high. Both were found in pieces. The head of the western statue was kept in the Cairo Museum for 70 years. By the king's leg stands Nefertari, his major and beloved wife. A 
figures were called a Ra of the Rulers, as the carvings on their shoulders indicate, it might have meant that Ramesses identified himself with Amun Ra, king of all gods, hence Statue's second name, the one who hears the petitions of mankind. Walls in the courtyard are adorned with religious scenes, hymns and cartouches. Like here, Ramesses the Great delivering mud to Amun Ra, indicating that he fulfilled his duty of preserving the sacred order. Or here, a typical offering scene. Besides Ramesses, reliefs in the courtyard display his family, wives, princes and princesses, all making offerings to the gods. In almost every Egyptian temple I've been to, especially on the lower registers, rows or vertical or horizontal oval grooves are to be found. They were made by pious pilgrims, who scratched off tiny bits of the sacred walls to take a little bit of divine power home. A 6th century Coptic church was filled in and used as a platform for a still functioning 13th century mosque, Abu el Hagag, making the Luxor temple the longest functioning religious place in the world. But what's even more interesting, in the Middle Ages the whole temple was covered in sand, rubble and debris, and the village consisting of houses, huts, workshops and barracks was built on top of it. The height of the mosque above the courtyard indicates the height to which the temple was buried. The oldest part of the courtyard, a platform with three chambers which had stood here long before Ramesses began enlarging and modifying the temple, probably already Hatshepsut commissioned construction of this triple bark shrine dedicated to Amun, Mut and Khonsu, the Theban triad. It was later usurped by her successor, Thutmose III. Obviously, as soon as Ramesses engaged in the temple's modification, the reliefs on the walls were changed. You've definitely noticed this is one of the most popular tourist places in Laksa. That's why I ran away from these massive crowds just to sit in the corner and contemplate these beautiful carvings. This charming scene depicts Ramas's children carrying flowers, ostrich feathers and other offerings to celebrate and commemorate the opening of the great pylon built by their father. We are heading to another ceremonial entrance located between the columns on the western side of the courtyard. In ancient times, this additional entryway was connected with a key, as processions took either river or land routes to reach the temple. The entrance is flanked with colossal statues of the pharaoh.
Being outside the temple, we've got a great opportunity to see aforementioned Ramesses military scenes carved on the pylon's walls. Getting back to the courtyard, we take a ride and enter the great colonnade hall of Amenhotep III. This was the entryway to the temple before Ramesses alterations. The 50 meter long passageway, originally entirely roofed, is flanked by seven pairs of enormous open papyrus columns. They reach 19 meters in height and support huge stone architrave slabs. Originally, the hall was almost completely dark due to high enclosing walls. The only sunlight came from clear story windows. Amenhotep III built the colonnade and surrounding walls, but died before decorations were finished. His son, Amenhotep IV, known more as Akhenaten, ordered his servants to deface existing sketches. Hence, the majority of decorations were made by Akhenaten's successors, Tutankhamun and I, and were later usurped by the last pharaoh of the 18th dynasty, Horemheb. On both sides of the passageway stand limestone double statues of the divine pair, Amun and Mut. They date back to the late 18th dynasty. The better preserved one on the western side displays facial features of Tutankhamun and his wife Anke Senamun. Please notice that figures' heads are much larger than their bodies. It was to provide the figures with a youthful appearance. Original inscriptions adorning sides and backs of their thrones were erased and replaced by Ramesses with his cartouches. We can now take a look at the fragment of Tutankhamun's carvings displaying soldiers and musicians taking part in the most important and also the longest festival in ancient Thebes, the Great New Year Festival, known as Opet Festival. The annual celebration started at the beginning of the flooding season in summer and initially during the Hatshepsut reign lasted 11 days but later expanded significantly and became almost one month long, 24 to 27 days during the reign of Ramesses III. We're now in the second courtyard, also known as Court of Amenhotep III. 64 columns with exquisite proportions were divided into two rows, arranged on three sides. The peristyle court measures about 45 by 56 meters and offers three additional gateways to the temple, two on the north and one in the southwest corner. The ancient Egyptians shared two perceptions of time, linear from birth to death and cyclical, sacred, relating to the afterlife, nature and gods. They believed that all deities, just like nature reborn thanks to the floods of the Nile, after a whole year needed new energy. Proper execution of the rituals conducted by the pharaoh would bring rebirth and renewal of their powers. But this was the secondary objective of the Opet festival. 
Walking through a hypostyle hall with four rows of eight columns, we travel almost two millennia into the future. The Chapel of Mood was transformed during the Roman period, at the end of the 3rd century CE, into the cultic chamber dedicated to the four emperors of Tetrarchy, hence two Corinthian columns, frescoes depicting dignitaries paying homage to one of the Tetrarchs, and an altar honoring the Emperor Augustus, inscribed in Latin. Later, this space was reused as a church. By the way, the frescoes are the only existing Roman wall paintings from the Tetrarchic period, which lasted less than 40 years. From here we're entering the holiest and the most secret part of the temple. Apart from dozens of smaller chapels located on both sides of the temple enclosure dedicated to the Egyptian Inuit and bark shrines for Khonsu and Mut, the heart of the temple consisted of a birth and coronation rooms, an offering vestibule, bark sanctuary of Amenhotep III rebuilt by Alexander the Great, and sanctuary of Amenemopet. Amenemopet was a local manifestation of Amun-Ra, exclusive to the Luxor temple, hence the festival's name, the Opet Festival. At the beginning of this episode I showed you the Avenue of Sphinxes. It was the ceremonial land route during the Opet festival. After making required offerings to the barks of the Theban triad in Karnak by the pharaoh, the procession began. Three sacred barks, plus the royal one, carrying the ka statue of the king, were borne on the shoulders of white-dressed, bald-headed priests, and each vessel was accompanied by a high priest wearing a leopard skin robe. Of course, the statues were fumigated and presented with different sorts of offerings during the passage, but were covered with high-quality fabrics to not be seen by the unworthy. to Tutankhamun's reliefs in the Amenhotep's colonnade, we can imagine how pompous these celebrations must have looked. Massive crowds standing on the Nile's banks or surrounding the Avenue of Sphinxes, cheering, chanting, clapping and marveling at the parade of color, sounds, costumes and movement. Marching soldiers, chariots with horses, musicians, dancers, princes, princesses, high officials, priests carrying flowers and animals for sacrifice. And behind them, the most awaited ones, the king, the queen and the gods. In front of us, fragments of ancient structures dating back to different periods displaying the wealth of the site's history. A piece from the Middle Kingdom stands next to the pieces from the reign of Thutmose III. Then cartouches of Thutmose IV, followed by pieces from buildings of Amenhotep III, Amenhotep IV, Akhenaten, and Seti I wearing beautiful Atef crown.
Ramesses III. As well as Roman Stili. The coronation of new kingship and confirmation of Pharaoh's divine right to rule were crucial points of the festivities, since the old kingdom, the royal Ka, part of a soul which included the divine presence, was handed down from the old to the new king after death. A possession of the sacred element needed to be yearly reconfirmed. It could only take place in dedicated for this purpose Luxor Temple, where the king met face to face with his sacred father Amun Ra and received divine powers. Massive crowds were waiting outside the temple or during the Ramasid period in the first courtyard to see the pharaoh transformed, authorized by divine forces to rule for the next year. In front of the temple in the Niktanibo courtyard, the only architectural survivor from the Roman period, the Temple of Serapis, built in the 2nd century CE, of course by Hadrian, dedicated to the Greco-Egyptian sun god Serapis, introduced in the 3rd century BCE, whose purpose was unification of Greek and Egyptian beliefs. Still functioning, beautiful Luxor temple visited by thousands of people every day, comprising different architectural and artistic styles, located in one of the most picturesque places in Egypt, in my opinion, represents to perfection the idea of eternal Egypt. Thank you for watching. To stay tuned, please tap the subscribe button and help my channel grow by commenting and sharing my content with your friends. And see you on another ancient site!